All right. Thank you, everyone. My name is Elliot Bowerman. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for Genesee Land Trust. Some of you might be members and you might know about the Land Trust, but I'm going to take a quick minute to introduce you to our organization. We started back in 1989 with a mission to protect local land and water in the greater Rochester region. So we cover all of Monroe and Wayne County, as well as bits of the adjacent counties to make like a half circle along the southern shore of Lake Ontario. Over the last 33 years, 34 years, we have protected more than 6,800 acres of land here in the region. That includes a large portion of farmland. We have some of the best farm soil <laughs> in the world. And as well, we protect natural habitats for local wildlife, and we create public nature preserves. We just purchased our 18th property to create a, uh, a new public preserve on Lake Road near Lake Ontario um, in the next couple of years. So we focus on that protection of land and water, as well as providing free community uh, events and walks, and I'm so excited to have this session about native alternatives for common invasive garden plants. One of the things that we can do directly at home is plant native plants so that our butterflies and our bees and our birds and all of the like critters that need that ecosystem can have that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan. Okay, great. Thanks again for having me here today. Um, my name is Megan Pistoli Shaw, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Slilo Prism. And I'll get into who we are momentarily. And here's a snapshot of what we will discuss today. I'd like to note that there will be a follow up email sent out to those who registered, and it will have a link to this recording along with resources that I shared today. So the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, or SLILO PRISM for short, is one of eight prisms that span the state of New York, creating a network of partnerships as an integrative approach to invasive species management. So the PRISM network stemmed from recommendations from the New York State Invasive Species Task Force. And the network began in 2008 and became fully established in 2013. The PRISM Network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. So SLILO encompasses the five counties of Oneida, Oswego, Jefferson, Lewis, and St. Lawrence, which you can see from the map there in green. And we are hosted by the Nature Conservancy and we collaborate with our partners to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. Megan, I'm just going to chime in real quick to acknowledge the Genesee Land Trust typically works with the Finger Lakes PRISM, and we do a lot of things in partnership, but PRISM overall is the state, so we're really grateful to have Megan able to share information about the native plants from our, from our neighbor, but like they're the same native plants across, across the region, so in case there was any confusion for folks. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, so before we dig too deep, I'd like to just start with the basics and consider what an invasive species is. So an invasive species can be a plant, an animal, or even a microorganism that is not native to the ecosystem they've become established in, and whose introduction causes harm to the economy, the environment, or to human health. Uh, the term invasive species can be easily confused as there are many non-native species that are not considered to be invasive. For example, apples and many other agricultural plants are non-native species that are considered to be beneficial to our cu culture rather than harmful. And there are also species that are considered to be a nuisance but are not invasive, uh, like dandelions, for example. Although I love dandelions, but you know how some people can get about dandelions in their yard. Um, so you may wonder why some non-natives are so invasive. Well, that is because when a species is introduced to a new environment, they enter that new area free from environmental factors that keep their populations in balance, like natural predators or parasites, for example. 
Uh, in addition, invasives also often produce many offspring or seeds. Uh, for example, one adult purple loosestrife plant can produce millions of seeds annually. And it is because of these characteristics, invasive populations often become very widespread. Which you can see in the bottom picture here, it shows invasive common reed or Phragmites filling an entire field with just a single shrub existing in the mass. In addition to lacking natural predators, invasives also have attributes that allow them to thrive in environments that other species may not do so well in, such as poor soil conditions. And you can see that pictured on the top right, showing um, the invasive Japanese knotweed growing right out of a hole in concrete. <clears throat> so if invasives are so bad for the environment, then why are they here to begin with? Well, there are many different ways that invasives can be introduced to a new area. A major introduction pathway is through global trade. So invasives from around the world, they hitchhike in ballast water and in cargo crates, and they often go unnoticed until they have spread far distances in their new homes. Uh, many plants that are now considered to be invasive or once considered a desired ornamental uh, that are often intentionally planted in gardens and yards and landscapes. For example, Japanese and bush honeysuckles are invasive plants that were often planted by gardeners to beautify their lawns or by highway designers uh, to control erosion or stabilize, stabilize banks. Uh, but however, over time, these non-native species, they can misbehave and escape our gardens and invade our natural areas where they outcompete native and desirable plant species and can impact entire ecosystems. So you can play a vital role in preventing the introduction and the spread of invasive plants by choosing to grow native plants in your gardens and your yards, which was mentioned earlier. So choosing native plants not only reduces the spread of invasive plants, but it also supports native wildlife. And this is because native plants have co-evolved with native wildlife and insects. Uh, there are many specialized relationships that exist between plants and birds and pollinators. Uh, for example, native birds like the chickadee, they rely on caterpillars to rear their young and native plants support caterpillars. Uh, monarch butterflies, they need native milkweed to complete their life cycle. Without the milkweed, the monarch larvae will die. And there's an invasive plant called swallowwort, uh, black or pale swallowwort, that are closely related to the native milkweed. And the monarchs can get confused and lay their eggs on the invasive swallowwort, which is toxic to the monarch caterpillars. So by choosing to grow native plants in your garden, you are supporting the birds, the pollinators, and other wildlife. And plus native plants support and the, are important pollinators like bees and other insects, which we all rely on for a majority of our crops. So here are a few quick tips to consider for using native plants to support pollinators. First, di diversify. At, use at least 15 different flowering species. Plant diversity equals wildlife diversity, and it strengthens the resiliency of your garden against pests and pathogens. Uh, successional blooming. Grow plants that bloom in the spring, in the summer, and into the fall. So there's food available throughout the entire growing season. And planting species in groups reduces the amount of work for pollinators. Uh, try to avoid hybrid species as they often have exaggerated plant parts that hinder the ability of our native pollinators to utilize the plant. Uh, there are many resources available to help you learn what is native and climate smart to your region, all of which I'll briefly mention here and I will provide links in that follow up email. So the National Wildlife Federation has developed a tool to help you identify plants that are native to your zip code. Um, the New York State DEC has developed brochures and plant lists that showcase plants that are native to the Northeast and what plants to avoid with native alternatives, many of which I will mention today. And the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change or Risk Management Group has developed a brochure that outlines gardening for present and future conditions using native species adapted to both current and future hardiness zones with a list of climate smart plants native to the Northeast. And Slilo Prism has created a list of non 
invasive trees as part of our urban forest sustainability initiative. <clears throat> so many of the species I'm about to talk about were introduced to the landscape as an ornamental or landscaping plant and have since spread to become invasive. And as I mentioned, because invasive plants are not from here, they don't support native ecosystems and wildlife in the same way that the native plants do. And I am not, um, and by all means, these plants I'm about to mention are not all of the uh, in, invasive plants that you may encounter in your yard. There's many more that I probably just didn't have time to talk about today. All right, so let's get right into it and talk about some of the invasive species that are often found in your garden in your yard, starting with uh, the bush honeysuckles. So these are deciduous shrubs that can grow to be about 15 feet tall. There, there are also native honeysuckles and an easy way to tell them apart is to cut a branch off and look for a hollow hole in the cross section. Invasive honeysuckles are hollowed. Uh, and the invasive bush honeysuckle, they leaf out early in the spring and also hold leaves late into the fall, which makes them a lot easier to spot. Um, they have small light to dark pink or white colored flowers that form in the spring or the summer. Later in the season, red berries will form. And the bush honeysuckles, they shade out native vegetation and reduce high quality food available for birds. So the birds, they can eat the fruit of the bush honeysuckles, but it's much lower quality nutrition than the native berries. So think of birds eating like fast food every day instead of something more nutritious. That's what the bush honeysuckle berries offer. Um, so the bush honeysuckles, they are um, a bit pesky to manage. Uh, if you try to trim them back, sometimes multiple branches will grow back in its place. Um, and you can do um, prescribed burning, hand pulling of seedlings, which is best done in the spring when the soil is loose and, and moist. Um, you can also do cuttings and herbicide treatments applied afterwards. Um, those are the control options for the bush honeysuckle. So there are some native alternatives that you can grow in your yard instead of bush honeysuckles, and that's the trumpet or the coral honeysuckle. Um, also American elderberry or downy serviceberry are good options and they have medicinal purposes and support wildlife. Um, the serviceberry shrubs, they bloom, bloom early in the spring, which makes them an essential early season food source for pollinators. And the American elderberry have pollen heavy flowers that attract a wide variety of pollinators. And their leaves provide food for many moth and lar moth larvae, including the pretty um, moth here that I'm about to show you pictured there. Look how pretty that is. So if you plant that American elderberry, you'll be supporting some beautiful moth um, varieties. Butterfly bushes. Yes, they're very eye-catching, they're hardy. And they seem like they're helpful to butterflies. I mean, the word butterfly is in their name, right? But they're invasive. So um, these shrubs can easily escape cultivation and invade natural areas. They crowd out native plants and reduce habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. And although butterflies are attracted to their long um, cone-shaped bright flowers, and the plant does provide ne nectar, it doesn't support the life cycle of the butterflies which need host plants to lay their eggs on. Uh, there are no known um, native caterpillars that can eat the butterfly bush leaves. Um, also butterfly bush can be controlled by cutting the trunk off at the base and applying herbicide to the exposed cut. Smaller bushes can be dug up making sure to collect all of the root system. And some native alternatives to the butterfly bush are summer sweet, which have beautiful fragrant flowers that attract many pollinators, and they act as a natural pest and disease resistant. Uh, then the blazing star, uh, also hummingbirds, which we, you know, we love hummingbirds and they, they love the blazing star. Um, the giant hyssop also provides nectar for pollinators and is well suited to restore pollinator habitats, and both have known medicinal properties. Another invasive shrub is the multiflora rose, and this plant has thorns and clusters of white flowers, as opposed to the native roses, which only have one flower at the end of each stem. 
Uh, it forms red berries later in the season. And multiflora rose produces very thick brumbles, which it, it exclude uh, native vegetation, and it makes it nearly impossible and very painful, might I add, to walk through. <laughs> I run into this stuff a lot when I'm doing uh, field surveys. Uh, this plant is the host of a rose rosette disease, uh, which disfigures the rose flowers and the leaves and cause is excessive thorniness, if you will, <laughs> and it can be easily spread. Um, by infected plants. And the multiflora rose seeds can remain viable in the soil for up to 20 years. That's a long time. So even if you remove the plants, they can still pop back up over time. So you'll have to monitor for it when you're doing removals. Uh, you can mow the plants often throughout the growing season and for multiple years, and this will help kill the plant. Um, smaller plants can be controlled by hand digging the plant and being sure to remove the roots. <clears throat> so in addition to providing nectar and pollen to various species of bees and butterflies, nine bark is also a host plant for several um, moth caterpillars, including the amazing unicorn caterpillar, which you can see pictured here. It actually has like, um, like a little horn on its back there, it looks like. Um, and bush button is frequented by skippers and monarchs and virtually any butterflies that happen to be passing by. And spice bush provides food to pollinators in the form of nectar, uh, forage for several caterpillars, berries for birds and forage for deer. Uh, this plant is excellent source for attracting wildlife to your area. Plus it gives a beautiful display of golden yellow leaves in the fall. It kind of looks like, um, or Scythia in a way. So this is a good native option for that. Um, Japanese barberry is an invasive shrub with thorns and it is commonly used in landscaping. Unfortunately, they can easily escape our yards and grow in the forests as birds often feed and disperse their seeds. Uh, the leaves are arranged in little clusters and red berries form late in the summer. Um, and under its thick branches, it provides a nice protected habitat for mice and chipmunks. Uh, and in areas with lots of barberry, tick populations often increase, which in turn risks increases the risks of Lyme disease because of that protective habitat that it provides. Also in areas invaded by Japanese barberry, there may also be an increase in invasive earthworm populations and soil erosion. So you can cut the Japanese barberry, um, but it will result in resprouting in the stem. So to prevent the resprouting, you just spray the stumps with a concentrated glyphosate-based herbicide. So two comparable native alternatives to the invasive barberry are uh, winterberry holly and hazel, American hazelnut. So the USDA reports that the berries of the winterberry provide food for small mammals and over 48 bird species. Uh, so while the berries are low in fat content, they provide a valuable source of food in the winter and when other sources of, of food are scarce. And uh, the environmental benefits of hazelnuts make them an attractive plant for conservation that provide windbreaks, hedges, or riparian buffers. And as a food source, the hazelnut plants provide soft mass from their um, cat skins and hard mass in the fall and winter through their nuts, creating a diverse food source for multiple animals. Burning bush is an ornamental woody shrub with vibrant red to purple fall foliage and has a very and is a very common invasive shrub found in yards. I see this just about everywhere. It seems like everybody used this um, from, um, and it's just still around in uh, urban areas, especially. Um, it can easily escape cultivation through its seeds and by sprouting new stems when branches touch the ground. Uh, it's resistance to deer browse, which may encourage increased browsing on native plants and its shallow root system increases the rate of erosion. Uh, so after cutting the main stem, a treatment of herbicide can be applied directly to the cut stump to kill the root system. Alternatively, returning um, to cut or mow, any resprouted stems will also suppress regrowth. 
So there are some great native alternatives out there, including black chokeberry, serviceberry, American cranberry bush, and high bush blueberry, all of which provide food and habitat for wildlife and support pollinators. The high bush blueberry also provides nectar for pollinators and supports the brown elfin larvae, uh, which have one flight and appear from May through June in the north. You can see that picture there on the bottom right. Porcelainberry is an ornamental vine. It produces greenish yellow flowers that develop into hard berries in various shades of purple to bright blue with a speckled sheen similar to porcelain, hence its common name, porcelainberry. Uh, it grows quickly and can outcompete native vegetation and it can strangle or girdle trees that it climbs onto. A combination of mechanical and chemical methods is most effective and the large vines can be cut near the ground and treated with a chemical herbicide or repeated cutting must occur and avoid pulling vines off trees as this can damage the tree or cause yourself injury. And the cut vines will eventually decompose. Uh, all courses of treatment should be completed before fruiting occurs, which occurs in uh, late fall to avoid building a seed bank. And then the herbicide applied in the fall will draw the treatment to the roots more effectively. <clears throat> Coral or trumpet honeysuckle, box grape, and American bittersweet are good native alternatives to invasive porcelain berry. Uh, the coral honeysuckle flowers, they provide nectar for pollinators and attract hummingbirds. The fox grape, it provides food for wildlife and also people, if you're into that. And American bittersweet berries provide food for birds, but all parts of the plant are actually considered poisonous for people, so don't eat them, okay? Uh, Oriental bittersweet is an invasive deciduous woody vine. Uh, the fruit starts out green in color and then turns yellow in late summer with the outer layer splitting into three parts, revealing a bright red fruit inside, which grow in clusters along the vine stems. The fruit actually helps to distinguish invasive bittersweet from the native American bittersweet, which have red berries as well, um, with orange capsules that grow and clusters on the vine tips. So you can see that pictured here, the difference between the invasive oriental bittersweet on the left and the native American bittersweet on the right. So the oriental bittersweet outcompetes trees and shrubs and other vegetation through climbing and shading. Uh, it may also kill trees by strangling or girdling them and the berries are easily spread by birds. Um, and it can be controlled by cutting the vines close to the ground and digging up the roots. Again, avoid pulling the vines out of the trees to avoid damaging the tree or causing yourself injury. And the cut stems that aren't dug out should be treated with an herbicide after cutting to avoid respouting. And the, again, the herbicide application is best done in the fall when the plants are naturally drawing uh, the solution down to their roots more effectively. And coral trumpet honeysuckle is another, again, mentioned here as a good native alternative. So is trumpet vine. And again, American bittersweet are good native alternatives to this invasive oriental bittersweet. Uh, the tubular flowers and the large quantities of nectar produced by the coral honeysuckle and the trumpet vine, they will attract uh, hummingbirds and butterflies. And although the berries of the American bittersweet, as I mentioned, are reported to be poisonous, there are songbirds, uh, grouse and pheasants and fox squirrels that will eat those fruits. <clears throat> and Japanese tree lilac is a non-native tree that is starting to be thought of as being invasive. And it is commonly found growing along streets and in green spaces in urban areas. It can grow to be about 40 feet tall it has reddish brown cherry tree like bark with uh, dark green leaves that have a rounded base. It has these small fragrant flowers that grow in large white clusters in the spring, usually the beginning of June, but they only last a few weeks. Um, small saplings can be hand pulled. Larger trees are harder to manage. Um, pruning can reduce the flowering. And some native alternatives to the Japanese tree lilac are summer sweet, 
broadleaf meadow sweet. And although it's not native, um, common lilac are not invasive and also could be considered a good alternative to uh, the Japanese tree lilac. And all three have beautiful fragrant blooms that attract pollinators. Okay, and I just wanted to give a brief and general overview of some of the control methods that you can use for invasive plants. Um, they can be controlled manually, mechanically, and through chemical methods. Uh, the bulleted sections on this uh, slide here provide general tips for each method. Um, but in general, uh, the manual control, such as digging and hand pulling, is most effective on small invasive plant populations and is best done in the spring when the plants are smaller and the soil is loose. Uh, it's important to remove the root system and avoid leaving behind plant fragments with, that may re-sprout. Um, mechanical methods such as mowing and cutting are effective for medium-sized invasive plant populations where hand pulling could be very cumbersome. It's best to cut the plants to ground level before flowering occurs and mowing will most likely need to occur multiple times throughout the growing season. And to avoid re-sprouting, uh, remove the clippings from the site and place them in a sunny spot for about two weeks prior to disposal or composting. And if there are remains with seeds, place the remains in a black plastic bag um, before solarizing, and that's just putting it in the sun for a period of time inside that black plastic bag. Uh, and then for chemical methods, as mentioned a few times, they are most effective um, during the fall time, depending on the plant, uh, and they're best applied on medium to large sized invasive plant populations where mechanical methods are unfeasible. Uh, it's very important to follow all chemical label instructions to ensure the effectiveness and to avoid causing harm to the environment or possibly yourself. So always apply the um, herbicides at peak growth before the seed production. And again, fall is often the best time to apply the herbicides to ensure that the chemical is drawn to the plant's root system. And treated plants should be undisturbed for about two weeks with um, no disposal being required. And there's some folks asking questions um, in the chat and I'm gonna, be saving some time towards the end um, to answer questions, if that's okay. Um, so I'm just gonna shift our discussion to just share some ways that you can get involved. So a fun and easy way that you can get involved is to take the Pledge to Protect, uh, which is an outreach initiative that anyone can participate in. There are five pledge categories that can be taken. Uh, there's lands and trails, which is themed towards landowners and hikers, uh, forests, which is themed towards forest owners or managers, waters, which is themed towards boaters, waterfront property owners, and water recreationists, community, which is themed towards those who live in urban areas, and gardens, which is themed towards gardeners and landscapers, which I would sus suspect most of you on the phone would be interested in taking the pledge to protect your garden. So upon taking the pledge, you become what we, what we like to call a protector and you unlock resources themed for the category that you've taken the pledge to protect. So in addition to gaining access to helpful resources, protectors are sent monthly email blogs that provide specific but simple actions you can take to protect your favorite hiking trails, paddleways, garden or community from invasive species. So right after taking the pledge, you get instant bragging rights along with collect collectible virtual badges. Uh, you get chances to win prizes and access to a social media toolbox that has pre-made graphics that you can share on your social networks to celebrate becoming a, protect a protector. So visit ipledgetoprotect.org and join the protectors today. And there's also a QR code on the screen if you're really ambitious and wanna take the pledge right now. And I will also have a link to this in your follow up email. And another great way to get involved is to volunteer with us. So Slilo Prism has an invasive species volunteer surveillance network or VSN, where you can be trained to recognize and report invasive species threatening the Slilo region 
using a community science tool called IMAP Invasives, which you can see the app pictured on the photo on the right hand side of this uh, slide here. That's the IMAP Invasives mobile app. Uh, we also have opportunities to assist terrestrial and aquatic invasive species removals and restoration efforts. And there's a link to volunteer uh, here at that website and you can scan that code and there's a sign up form where you can sign up to become one of our volunteers. And that concludes my presentation. If we wanna just open the floor for, for discussion and questions, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Elliot, do you wanna lead the Q&A with the chat questions? Sure, sure. What is an example of an herbal herbicide according to Randy? I'm not sure about an herbal. I'm assuming you mean a non-chemical application. Is that what you mean by herbal herbicide? Yeah, I think so. I'm thinking okay. like something, some like a natural herbicide. Is there something that we could use like vinegar? Or what, do we, what, what could we use? Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I have read online that there's solutions that folks can mix up with like vinegar and salt, but that's not my um, area of expertise to give specific guidance on that. Um, I do okay. understand the concern of, you know, using herbicides and everything, but the thing with herbicides is, is like, okay, if you're controlling an invasive plant in your yard, it's probably just a couple plants, right? Because it's in your yard. So if you're careful and you read, you know, you follow all the instructions, uh, you know, maybe wear some gloves and you're only applying small amounts, um, especially if you're just like cutting, cutting like the trunk of something, the stem of something, and then just taking like a paintbrush or a sponge and then just applying it directly to that cut exposed area, you're gonna have minimal um, impacts on, on the other plants growing nearby. Now, if you're walking around with like, you know, a sprayer and you're just spraying it everywhere, then yeah, you might have some more negative impacts, but I would suspect that folks on the call here might be just dealing with, you know, a couple plants here or there, depending on what it is in their yard. Does that help yeah. answer that question? Thanks, Megan. Um, I think so. I, for, for folks that uh, get the recording, the chat doesn't come in. So I wanted to uh, let you know that um, one person is saying that glyphosate, they're getting pushback on using that from their community. And then Nicole actually recommended you can look into try Clopire, I don't know, T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R as an alternative um, to glyphosate. Um, glyphosate, I don't know how to say these things. I think it's glyphosate, um, but yeah, I, yeah, that's how I pronounce it. And triclophor. Yeah, yep, thank you. Um, so that might be an option for, for folks, especially um, if you're getting pushback in your community. Um, we have a question from Catherine P. Um, and the question is, and before I ask the question, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give a plug. Uh, Genesee Land Trust is hosting our annual native plant sale on May 13th at the Brighton Town Hall. And that will start at 8 a.m. We have a bunch of native plants. We sold out really fast last year, so we're, we're going to get a lot more this year. Um, so that's a great place to get native plants. Um, and one of the questions here is, where can I purchase some of these native bushes that, um, that you mentioned in the presentation? Native flowers are easy, even mm -hmm. some native trees, but bushes don't seem to be as easy to find. Um, my experience with that is, um, so this your local soil and water conservation district likely has native plant sales and they often do have some like bushes and things like that that are known to be good for reducing soil erosion and for restoration and things like that. So I would just maybe go to their website or even call up your local soil and water conservation district. And as mentioned, um, you know, like the Cornell Cooperative Extensions and things like that, they often have annual plant sales uh, and they have very affordable plants too. I mean, usually there's vegetables and flowers and house plants and <clears throat> you name it, and it's usually there. So maybe going to some of those. Plus, there's the DC's um, Saratoga 
um, Springs Nursery and they have a website, which I'll make a note um, to just include links to some of these resources and plant sales that I know of. Um, and I'll put them in the follow-up email. Um, Thanks, Megan. If you could Zach, look, you, I, I, I posted Zach is on the, the line and he might have some, sorry, Zach, if you have any um, thing to add for uh, resources for native plants, feel free to chime in. Go ahead, Elliot, sorry about that. Thank you. I was just going to say, um, Deb just uh, posted that the Monroe County Soil and Water Conservation District is having a sale now and you need to order by uh, March 1st. Um, so uh, I included a link to their site uh, in the chat. Um, it'd be great if you could include that as well in your follow-up. Um, folks in the chat are also saying White Oak Nursery in Canandaigua is a resource and the Plantsman in Dryden. And, um, oh, why am I forgetting the name? There's a native plant place down in Dansville. Uh, Elliot, if you want to give me a list of things to include in the follow-up email, like if you have links and stuff, um, feel free to email them to me. Oh, yes, okay. I forgot about, oh, wait, where'd it go? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Prairie Amanda's Moon. Garden in Dansville, which also provides some of the native plants that we will sell on the 13th of May. Um, and we do have some bushes and trees at that. Um, Elliot, are you able to grab these links for me and put them in a follow-up email? Yes. All right, I perfect. Will. I'll grab these right now. Yep, the Saratoga Springs ships, you know, the Saratoga Springs um, nursery, tree nursery. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm curious how many folks are planning to take some of what you learned today and, and plant in your gardens? What might you change? Thanks, Jennifer. Butterfly effect in Geneva. I will say that um, just be cautious of ordering seeds online. Um, you know, be choosy which companies you're going through to make sure that they're actually, you know, giving you seeds of the plant that's going to be, you know, native to your eco region. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between like a native and a native hybrid? Should I be worried about a hybrid versus a native native? Uh, so the hybrids often have exaggerated plant parts, like, you know, larger blooms, for example, things like that. And just because they're not invasive um, doesn't mean that they don't have an impact on like the wildlife or the pollinators because the pollinators they're used to the native plants and the way that the structure of those native plants are are usually um, mm -hmm. or naturally so when you have an exaggerated plant part that they might not recognize the plant that they think is native and they might not know how to use it because of the plant parts being different or more mm -hmm. exaggerated, does that make sense? So they might not be invasive, but they also might not be providing those benefits that the native plant would be providing. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so it's definitely something to look out for when you're at a nursery to check between native and native hybrid. Is there a way that we can, can see that? Uh, usually, it's my understanding that usually um, when you're buying a plant, from anywhere, it will say the, the species name on it. And then it will also say if it is a hybrid, usually like on the little plant name thing that they stick in there or like on a sticker or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I could be incorrect on that, but I believe so. Or just being choosy where you go, like rather than buying all of your plants from like a box store that's just might not be focused on the native varieties that are probably more focused on what they think will sell. Uh, you could yeah. go to smaller nurseries or local nurseries that aren't those big box stores that tend to put more care into the selection 
Mm -hmm. And because they understand that value, they're there, you know, of course they want to make money too, but it's been my experience that usually the nurseries are a good source to get the native species rather than the exotic or the hybrid varieties. Yeah. Um, Lizelli says if the plant has a name in quotes, it is a hybrid. So that's really helpful as well. Um, so a hybrid will say hydrangea scarlet. Um, and it will have the hybrid name and quotes after the species. So that's a great trick. And now I need to see if my grape asters that went crazy this year are actually a hybrid or a native native. I thought I was getting natives. Um, a couple of people are sharing um, some things that they're going to do. Uh, so this is great. Noreen is going to replace um, the privet with elderberry, hazelnut, and pagoda dogwood. Great choices. Henriette is planning on planting trees from the DEC and Arbor Foundation in the backyard instead of grass. Fantastic. I, I've read somewhere that grass is the number one crop we grow in the United States and we can't eat it. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. Um, Noreen would like to help the local park with buckthorn removal, but not sure how to approach them. So Noreen, I think the park and rec department um, Are you frozen? Ellie, I think you're frozen or I'm frozen. Twenty ninth, yank them out because they are invasive. So um, if you want to help with an invasive management at one of our properties, that is something coming up in July. I will have that listed on our website soon. Um, Oh, I see Noreen is saying that the park is not planning the, the removal. Um, yeah, that is definitely something to write a letter to your town supervisors about. Um, some folks might just start pulling stuff up, but we don't want you to get in trouble. Um, Donna is on year three of replacing your lawn with a native food forest ground cover this year as well as pawpaw maple elm and a mulberry which the deer ate yeah the deer are tricky like that um donna i'd love to see a picture of how that lawn to native food forest is is going um that's wonderful let's see jennifer says would encourage those who are removing invasives from a typical residential yard to try mechanical removal before chemicals. Usually not that tough to remove mechanically and why add the chemicals in your yard if not necessary. Um, so that's that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Um, I have tree of heaven in my yard and I'm, and I'm struggling. I just end up cutting it down every day, every year couple times a year because it grows so fast and then I uh I I have to throw it out like I don't compost it otherwise it's going to turn all the compost into tree of heaven as well so I put it in garbage bags and um try to keep that from spreading uh, do you look for spotted lanternfly on your tree of heaven um <clears throat> so we do Megan we have not had spotted lanternfly in our region yet um we have a number of uh, uh, boxes for monitoring on properties. Uh, I, I think the last I heard, the closest it had gotten was Syracuse. Um, as you know, the Finger Lakes region, especially our, our wineries and our orchards are, um, are, are very, very concerned about the spotted lanternfly. And, um, and, uh, and so we're doing our best to keep that keep that out. So for folks that don't know Tree of Heaven, the spotted lanternfly loves Tree of Heaven and it is everywhere. So um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, that book is actually about Tree of Heaven. It is uh, one of those invasives that thrives in um, disturbed soils and can grow through concrete and grows like 15 feet a year or something ridiculous. And um, and municipalities have planted it because it's this green 
fast growing, uh, well, you know, big tree with yellow, yellow flower cones and it's a mess, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, that's Donna, why I um, liked her for five years is, yeah, I mean, it, it will just keep going. Yeah, that's why it's important to um, choose to grow native to just avoid the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you, if, if you have it, if you've inherited it, like I have, you know, like it's really, it's really good to cut it down again so that we don't have that food for, for the spotted lantern fly that is probably going to get here eventually. Um, so. Well, they actually say there's been research about it. And if you're managing land that has a lot of tree of heaven, there's an approach that is recommended where a percentage of it is removed and gradually over time, because just cutting it all down will be like, make it so the food source that they like to eat, which is an invasive species, right? Isn't there anymore. Right. So then they go on to the next thing, which is native. We don't want them to do that. <laughs> so I don't, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have an orchard, win, right? <laughs> so I'm just going to Cutting it down mind, won't but... stop its spread is what I'm getting at. It'll just make it so it no longer has that as a food source, right? And it'll right. end up going to the next best thing, which is usually our native species. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer has a good point that tree of heaven looks a lot like native staghorn sumac. So don't cut the sumac in case of mistaken identity. One of the, that's a great point, um, Jennifer. One of the things that I learned last summer is that when you break off a tree of heaven stem from the main uh, a branch from the main uh, uh, trunk, like it'll look like a heart, like the the breaking the leaf off scar. part will look like a heart. Yeah, the leaf scar. And also if you crunch the leaves of Tree of Heaven, they smell like burnt peanut butter. The bark looks kind of like how, um like cantaloupe, like the fruit, like the skin of a cantaloupe. It looks like that. Uh, and then on the back side of, of the leaves, if you um, turn it over, they have this little granular tooth, this little like nubbin on the bottom of the leaf. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, there yep. you are. Lots of things to learn. <laughs> yes, yes. And Henriette says um, that uh, they keep pulling up garlic mustard and bishop's weed, placing it in black plastic bags, let it sun for a couple of weeks to bake and kill it. Still finding it, but hopefully less this year. So, Megan, in terms of like this inheriting these invasive species and, and wanting to, you know, replace them with natives, like how do we do that management? Because one of the things you said is invasives thrive in these places and dominate over the native, the native plants, right? Like, so how do we, how do we manage that? So the biggest thing is with invasives is that they tend to dominate disturbed areas. And what's more disturbed than a yard? Like you said, it's mostly grass, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of open space for things to come in and take over, right? So don't give it a chance. Grow lots and lots and lots of native shrubs and trees and flowers and things to take that space instead of having it be an open canvas, a blank canvas, if you will, for these invasives. Uh, and yeah, the bishop's weed, the gout weed, that stuff is just, I see it in every yard that I visit anywhere. And it's also um, can be widespread on like um, public, some of the public trails and areas that I've visited. Like maybe it was like planted in like a, like an area where there was some landscaping done, you know, in the welcome area and then just kind of spreads around. Um, so, I mean, and the garlic mustard, so someone mentioned garlic mustard. So if it's in your yard, sure, go ahead, you know, hand pull it and try to control it. But uh, there's been some studies done talking about how garlic mustard in natural forested areas um, is better left undisturbed. It'll eventually kill itself off. <laughs> but if you're going out there and removing it, you could be causing more damage in a forested setting uh, because what else are you ripping out? right? Um, but in your own yard, you're likely not going to be ripping out some rare trillium or something like that, um, <laughs> where if you're in a forested setting, you might accidentally squish things or rip things out that shouldn't be ripped out. Um, but I have garlic mustard in my yard too, and I just go out in the springtime, and whenever I'm out there gardening and doing prep work, if I notice one, I just yank it out of the ground, and mm -hmm. it's sort of like that game 
with like the little groundhogs that come up and you know, whack it on the head. <laughs> That's what I think of when I'm out there. Just say, oh, I see some garlic mustard or, you know, um, also I should have probably added this. I didn't think of it until now, but the um, wild parsnip is another one that you might notice in your yard. And uh, just, and I'll put this in the follow-up, um, but just be cautious with the wild parsnip because the sap can ir irritate your skin. Don't go out there with a weed whacker with the plant parts flying all over the place because where they land, they're gonna cause a blister. You don't want that, okay? So just be careful with the wild parsnip. You can remove it. You just need to do it carefully. Um, you can pull out the entire plant, wear gloves and bag it. You can cut the, you know, the plant heads off if you happen to not get to it until later in the season when it blooms, which is in the late summer, early fall. Um, but the best time is in the spring. And it kind of looks like um, the leaves of celery. That's the best way to describe it. And even the stalks kind of look like a celery stalk in a way. And they've got like grooves in it. Um, but yeah, you can just pull those right out of the ground. Just um, when the stems are more mature, just be careful not to go cutting into them without wearing gloves because the sap can cause damage to your skin. Yeah. Megan, uh, we have a question about composting garlic mustard. Is that something can, that can be done or with, with invasive, should we just like not be composting it because it's just going to perpetuate it? Uh, I mean, I think it's better to not compost it and with whatever it is you're going to be using in your yard, because you do uh, have the risk of accidentally allowing the plant to be reintroduced. Um, if you're going to compost things, it's best to solarize it like I was talking about earlier, like putting it, out, if it doesn't have berries and it's not um, Japanese knotweed, don't try to compost Japanese knotweed or giant hogweed <laughs> or anything like that. Um, if it doesn't have berries, uh, you can just lay it in a pile out in the sun and when it's dried up, it will be pr pretty harmless. Uh, but if it does have berries, then you need to bag that and solarize it. And I wouldn't compost anything with berries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're going to finish up. I just want to acknowledge Jacqueline is saying that Japanese knotwood is uh, roadside and growing in huge, huge growing patches and guesses that the town is spreading that knotweed um, when they do ditch maintenance and is feeling doomed. So Megan, um, I think a lot of us that care about the environment and are here talking about native species instead of invasives, like we recognize that um, there are some old practices that are, that are continuing in terms of, of, you know, municipal maintenance of, of land and, you know, and this kind of thing. Is there anything that we can, we can do? Does, does PRISM recommend anything? Like, I'm just thinking about calling and letter writing, you know, to try and, uh, educate the towns, but I'm just curious. Um, so the PRISM network, at least I know Slilo and I'm pretty sure other PRISMs do this too. We do uh, reach out to like the Department of Transportation and things like that. And there's a clean equipment protocol that has been established and um, distributed for multiple years. And it's just asking that, uh, you know, equipment that's used for that type of maintenance is cleaned before it's brought to new sites. And that um, depending on the plant that cuttings will occur during certain times of the year to avoid spreading and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, it's probably hard to regulate that <laughs> and to monitor it. So, I mean, if you are seeing something like that happening, maybe reaching out to your local municipality and just um, kindly and politely asking them if they're aware of the invasive species and just letting them know that you acknowledge that situation happening might be a good catalyst for change. Yeah. Uh, the Thank clean you. equipment protocol, is that what you're asking about, Susan? Yeah, I don't know what document. Oh, yeah. Wait, okay. I'll write it down and I'll add a hyperlink to that as too, as well. Wonderful. We actually have a letter too that I'll look for um, as well that explains everything that you can send directly to your municipality if you'd like. Yeah, I think like, you know, being a little, a little noisy to your, your municipality can pay off. Um, I do recognize that there's this like conflicting uh, stress. We had a native plant session um, last summer where Lori Brocolo, um works with a, a bunch of, you know, developers and, and, and towns to try and put native wildflowers into places. 
and um and they had these beautiful native wildflower beds along the sides of roads and then somebody came in and just mowed it like just mowed it down because they were like we're supposed to mow the sides of the roads it was like ah so you know there's like this 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 culture of 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 expecting things to be tidy when in fact, like the wildflowers are beautiful and, and serve such a great purpose. So I think it's really important to try and, you know, educate and communicate as much as we can about that. Yeah. There's a lot with like, uh, you know, raking your leaves. There's like, is it good? Is it bad? Like <laughs> people yeah. are going crazy, like you're raking the leaves up. I mean, and like, in like a natural setting, it's good to have like the leaf litter and debris and whatnot, because what does it do? It feeds the soil. But again, in yards, like for lawns, kill your grass. it doesn't really do much except for kill your grass, right? So it's like, there's this contradiction there. Um, and also just being careful with what you do with lawn debris in the fall, because you could spread invasives or make homes for things that you don't want to have around in those things so that's like another controversial and we could have a whole other webinar on that <laughs> so oh yeah <clears throat> yeah lucas is saying uh worked at broke low and they had to replace an entire lawn because it turned into bishop's weed and gout weed exclusively and um you know one of the things that uh Lori said in the last session was like as much as possible to turn your lawn into into something wild you know into native plants so like you can make it intentional but like less grass more plants is a is a great way to move um she recommended stop mowing it <laughs> um and put a sign on it and if you're um if your uh homeowners or your municipality complains if you mow around the edges and make it look like it's an on-purpose garden like you can do that too um so just some things to consider and of course there's the no mow may movement to um you know to let um to let things like grow through the month of may if you can um is is always helpful um, with that, I want to be respectful of time. Are there any last uh, statements you want to make, Megan? No, I'm just not sure if I got everything in the chat. I was trying to run through it and see if I did or not. Um, yeah, I copied a bunch of the links um, around the resources for native oh, plants. Okay. So Deb, um, if you're wanting to have me possibly speak to your management council, um, when I send the follow-up email, it'll have my contact information in um, Monroe County. Is that Rochester? Yeah, that's where we are, Megan. We're in Monroe, okay. <laughs> in Ma yeah, Monroe there. and Wayne County. Um, okay, so, so then you have the Finger Lakes Prism out there and the Western yep. New York Prism is nearby too. Not saying yep. that I won't do it, but they also yeah, offer yeah. presentations. I'm just throwing it out yeah. there. <laughs> it'd be great to, it'd be great to, you know, share whoever um, locally we should talk to as well. Yeah, um, you can talk to any, gonna... any of us, not just, you know, you don't have to stick to those boundaries or whatever. I'm just saying that they do yeah. exist over there. Yep. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Megan. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, on behalf of Genesee Land Trust, we're so grateful for the actions that every person takes to help our local wildlife, the birds and the bees and the butterflies all need um, as much native plants as we can. So um, thank you again, and uh, we will send these links and follow up. And if you have any other questions, please do stay in touch. Thanks, everyone.